For a few months now, it seems like immigration has dominated political discussions and protests in our state and around the country. And I'm sure that many of you came to today's conference with a certain presidential candidate on the mind, but I hope that our conversation today will push past the most obvious and recent xenophobic proclamations to build walls and to begin mass deportations. Because even absent the most outlandish statements from the presumptive Republican nominee for president, the immigrant population in the United States will still stand at more than 42 million people, or just over 13% of the country's population. And even without those proclamations, Wisconsin's own immigrant community will still stand at 5% of the state's population, which itself has grown from 2.5% in 1990 and 3.6% in 2000. And so before we can confront Donald Trump's best laid plans for building national borders, we need to look inward and analyze the labor movement's own checkered history with immigration and our relationship with immigrant communities. I hope that our discussions today will push back against that narrative that has been popular among employers for decades and for some reason still has cash among labor, a few labor organizers and scholars that immigrants shouldn't be or can't be organized or that for some reason immigrant workers are disinclined to fight for better wages and working conditions. So I'd like to point to two very different events at the Wisconsin State Capitol that have occurred over the last year that I highlight the idea of distinct narratives for the future of our own state's labor movement. The first is the Right to Work rally in March of 2015, which drew some 2,000 marchers. The second is the protest organized by Rosas de la Frontera against proposed anti-immigrant legislation in February of this year, which drew more than 20,000 protesters who occupied the Capitol. I was at both of those events. The first felt like a requiem, a somber event with undertones of a funeral for workers who had resigned themselves to the continual assault on organized labor from Wisconsin's governor and GOP legislators. The other, however, this year was a call to arms with thousands of workers walking off of their jobs on a one-day strike to demonstrate their vitality and their central place in our state. Chanting, El Pueblo Unido Jamás Será Vencido, or A People United Will Never Be Defeated, immigrants and their allies successfully pushed back legislation that would have empowered local police officers to surveil, detain, and help deport those without legal documentation in our communities. So why do I bring these two protests up? It's my belief that this year's Día Sin Latinos Emigrantes, or Day Without Latinos and Immigrants, demonstrates the most viable path forward for our state's labor movement. This February, immigrants, most not members of any labor organization, mobilized within their communities and made a successful stand. Their activism even successfully rankled the wrath of employers like those in the dairy industry against politicians who fear the economic loss of thousands of immigrants immigrant workers either walking off the job, or if these laws pass, of mass deportations. The protests garnered national media attention because pol politicians and business leaders came to see what immigrant community, the immigrant community has known for a very long time, that without their labor, state and national economies would simply collapse. According to a 2008 Perryman Group report, if all unauthorized immigrants were removed from Wisconsin, the state would lose $2.6 billion in economic activity, over $1 billion in gross state domestic product, and over 14,000 jobs. So for decades, there has been strength within this immigrant community, strength to mobilize and strength to fight back. For the majority of our movement's history, however, labor has either ignored or pushed back against that strength. We can be harbored by more recent developments that have brought these two communities together, showing an alternative for solidarity. I hope that this talk and today's conference historicizes those fights we are in today so as to better illuminate a path forward for all members of the working class. Now, immigrant transplants have been central to the development of Wisconsin's labor, robust labor and socialist movements since the late 19th and early 20th century. In 1890, immigrants comprised 90% of Milwaukee's workforce, while they were 65% of the working class were also foreign born. <laughs> As many of you know, the 1886 Bayview demonstrations were powered by strikers protesting in German and in Polish. Ethnicity and nationality were fundamental attributes in the development of Wisconsin's early unions, as brewers, bricklayers, and typographers had sections committed to specific ethnic groups. 
German immigrants like Paul Gratkow, leader of Milwaukee Central Labor Union in the late 19th century, and Victor Berger, president at the founding of the Wisconsin State Federation of, of Labor in 1893, helped define the direction of the state's labor movement. And under the direction of Robert Schilling, who considered race, nationality, and religion irrelevant bars to participation in the labor movement, the Wisconsin Knights of Labor became early innovators in forming women's assemblies and organizing unskilled immigrant laborers. Now, despite those early points of collaboration, however, Wisconsin's labor leaders also presented, at times, a more reactionary face to growing immigration trends, ones that often mirrored national tendencies within the labor movement. In 1917, the Wisconsin State Federation of Labor passed a resolution opposing the importation of Asian workers, who they referred, referred to derisively as, quote, coolie labor, in order to preserve what they said was, quote, the purity of the Caucasian race and their standards of livelihood. Historian Daryl Holter reminds us that, like in many other industrialized areas around the country, the arrival of new immigrants in the late 19th and early 20th century created tensions among the various working class communities. While within the labor market and workplace, new ethnic pecking orders dictated who would receive better positions and higher pay. Wisconsin's restrictive actions followed a troubling trend in the early development of national or labor organizations. The California Workingmen's Party, with slogans like, quote, Chinese must go, actively supported laws that led up to and followed the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. Asian exclusion became a rallying cry for early unions, so much so that immigration restriction would become a defining factor and indelible taint for organized labor throughout the late 19th century. This period was one of the earliest, most concrete examples of what historian Bill Ong Hing refers to as old labor turning on new labor, as unions blamed immigrant workers for the former's low wages, poor working conditions, and unsatisfactory living standards. The early American Federation of Labor followed suit, advocating for quotas on immigration from Southern and Eastern Europe and Asia, and for barriers such as literacy tests in order to reduce the influx of unskilled laborers in the, to the US. The 1917 literacy law, which labor leaders such as Samuel Gompers actively lobbied for, became one of the labor movement's crowning achievements in the early 20th century. The AFL further supported the 1921 Immigration Emergency Quota Act and the 1924 johnson Reed Immigration Act, and in doing so, joined nativists and eugenicists in opposing the immigration of Southern and Eastern Europeans and Asians to this country. These protectionist stances were buttressed, however, by efforts from labor organizations such as the Industrial Workers of the World and unions such as the International Ladies Garment Workers Union, who actively organized among immigrants. The Lawrence Textile Strike of 1912, driven by Southern and Eastern Europeans, demonstrated the viability and the vigor with which immigrants would fight back against degradation on the job. The ILGWU, working among Russian, Italian, African American, and Puerto Rican workers, advocated for social unionism that valued a multicultural membership. These labor and socialist leaders pushed the boundaries of interracial mobilization and showed an alternative model for unionism throughout the first decades of the 20th century. In the 1930s, members of unions in the insurgent CIO continued to push back against craft unions' earlier nativist stances instead organizing among immigrant and second generation communities and advocating for what historian Elizabeth Cohen has called a culture of unity. Two of the CIO's most effective left-led internationals in the 1930s and 1940s, the United Cannery Agricultural Packing and Allied Workers of America and California, and the Inter uh, International Union of Mine, Mill, and Smelter Workers in New Mexico, developed an intense community consciousness built on resistance to racial discrimination. Within these unions, communists and leftists advocated for anti-racist union organizing. And in turn, Mexican and Asian Americans saw these organizations as allies for advocating for social justice and racial equality. These types of unions were, in the words of historian James Lawrence, advanced agents for a new America. The 1955 merger of the AFL and the CIO also brought somewhat of a liberalization in immigration policies. While no longer standing as outright opponents to legal immigration, labor leaders shifted their legislative agenda to increase border enforcement and employer sanctions, and continued to strongly oppose undocumented immigration into the 1970s. It wasn't until the 1980s that the international signaled a real shift in their policy. Under the leadership of Lane Kirkland, the AFL-CIO supported the Immigration Reform and Control Act of 1986, which provided amnesty for three million undocumented immigrants. 
as evidence the SEI Youth Justice for Janitors campaign in Los Angeles, organized labor's outreach to immigrant workers presented the potential for a broader nationwide labor resurgence. The successful mobilization of Latino workers, formerly, formerly seen as, quote, unorganizable or threatening to the economic security of domestic workers, now represented a new path forward for organized labor. Campaigns like Justice for Janitors stood exam as examples of what sociologist Ruth Milkman has referred to as new unionism, where locals might successfully reinvent themselves as social movement unions committed to racial immigrant justice. In 2000, AFL-CIO leadership finally disavowed a 100-year tradition of restriction and fear by openly calling for amnesty and full labor protections for all immigrant workers, regardless of their legal status. 